All right, I got a plan. We're going to go check out a Unitarian Universalist church. Specifically, we're going to the First Unitarian Church of St. Louis, Missouri, which is totally different than anything I've ever done on this channel before, because here, I'm a Christian, we do Christian stuff, I go around to different churches, but they're all historical, creedal, orthodox Christian traditions. Here, we're going to go check out a totally different religion. Unitarian Universalism is not a part of Christianity. It is a distinct thing. Now, way back in the distant past, there's some overlap here and there, and I think you'll catch that in the early part of the this video, in the early part of the conversation. But as we really get into the conversation, you'll see what I saw and what my conversational dance partner, who I'm excited to introduce you to here in just a minute, also saw, which is, no, these are truly distinct traditions, and these distinct traditions on many points are mutually exclusive one way or the other. And so, look, I don't know how to introduce a video like this, and I'm not sure how well it's actually going right now. It's a bit clumsy, but I still want to say up front that every video I make on this channel is at least in part in the hopes that those of you who watch it and aren't Christians might be Christians someday. I don't care if it's not exactly my version or my Christian tradition, but I think the actual God of the universe is behind this stuff. I think that he's existed forever in three persons. I think that there's life in this. And if I think this is the truest, realist, life-givingest thing ever, I mean, what kind of a jerk would I be if I didn't hope that you would consider being a part of it? And so, on some level, all the videos I make here are meant to be persuasive, I've just kind of forfeited my imagined right to control the fine-tuning on all of that. I think that's something that kind of has to happen locally and in your own life and in your own process. So all of that said, any video I've gone and made and made up to this point, I'm completely at peace with the idea that, like, ah, somebody might sign up for that version of Christianity. It's not exactly the one that I do, but, you know, okay, I can work with that. This is a little different for me because, straight up, no, I don't want you to become a Unitarian Universalist. I want you to become a Christian, which might raise the question for you, well, then why make the video at all? Well, I suppose the answer to that is because I wanted to learn about Unitarian Universalism, and I thought you might like to as well. And because I want to understand my neighbors in this world who think different things than me, and I want to get a really clear picture of what they believe and why, and I want to hear it from somebody competent who actually practices this particular religion and who can articulate what it's meant to them and the finer points and nuances of the history and the theology and the details behind all of it. In other words, I, I want to learn about it, and I want to learn about it from someone who will steel man the tradition instead of straw manning the position. Now, it's super easy for me to go and find somebody who doesn't like a given religion from a Christian perspective, who's just going to straw man it, and then I can be like, oh yeah, sure enough, no, it's bad. But I think it's way more interesting and way more challenging and compelling for those of us who practice a different religion from Unitarian Universalism, that being Christianity, to, to hear a quality articulation of someone else's religious tradition, because that pushes us and it makes us think about our own in ways that I think are really fruitful and challenging as well. So with that said, let's go sit down with Reverend Kim Mason and learn a little bit more about Unitarian Universalism. What is Unitarian? Yeah. <laughs> so Unitarian literally means the unity of God. So not Trinitarian. Not Trinitarian. Okay. Yes. So lots of people over hundreds of years of Christianity you know, folks in England and folks in Transylvania, everybody going, hmm, you know, I read the Bible myself and I don't know if I agree with this Trinity thing. Um, and so they, they start thinking and they start talking and, and the whole time it's heretical, right? The once, once the Council of Nicaea happens and, and, and the Trinity becomes doctrine, to say that you aren't so sure about the Trinity is heresy. But people throughout time have said, I don't know about that, until eventually this minister in 1819 
finally stands up and says, all right, I'm gonna define Unitarianism for all of y'all. And he stands up and he preaches a sermon called Unitarian Christianity, and which lays out not only the belief in the unity of God, but that um, God is a loving God, which you might remember is also in direct opposition to Calvinist doctrine of the time, right? That angry so? God. Well, the Calvinists are like, you know, God is mad. People are sinful and God is mad. And, um, and this minister, William Ellery Channing says, I think God loves us and wants the best for us. And, and he goes on and he says, we're still Christian. We still follow the teachings of Jesus, but that's it. Jesus is our teacher. And if we are to claim a Christian identity, then we are following the teachings of Jesus so that we might achieve salvation through character. So, so an, an earned salvation as opposed to the historical Christian doctrine of uh, an imparted righteousness that is apart from the law, that is by Christ's work on the cross. That, so it, it's by the righteousness of Christ in historical Christianity mm -hmm. that one is saved in Unitarianism. Do I say Unitarian or Universalist Unitarian? Ah, so you asked about what is a Unitarian. You didn't ask me what a Universalist is. Okay, and, and is this church a Unitarian Universalist church? Is that yes. the order I say it in? Yes. And that's different than a Unitarian? Yes. So what ah, happened was okay. there were two denominations. Okay. There were Unitarians and there were Universalists. And in 1961, they consolidated and became Unitarian Universalists. So there is no longer the Unitarian church? There are Unitarian churches in other countries that are not Unitarian Universalist. And those are... Christian, but without the Christian atonement theology, yeah. like the, um, the sacrificial substitutionary atonement, Correct. and without the Trinitarianism. Uh -huh. So they're non-creedal, they would say Christian, Christian groups would they say- They would say free Christian. Something else. Yeah, like in the UK, there are, it's the Unitarian and Free Christian Church. Okay, I got free in the name of my church too, yeah. so I can, I can relate on that part. The theologically sounds like we're pretty different, but I can relate on the free part. Uh huh. The universalist side, then, are there still universalist churches that didn't were not part of that merger, or is so, all of that absorbed? A lot of the aspects of universalism got absorbed into more mainline Christianity. Okay. So universalism, the universalists said, you know. There are doctrinal beliefs about you have to profess, you know, a, uh, an understanding of Jesus as your savior. You have to um, identify as a Christian in order to be saved. And the Universalist said, you know, we also aren't so sure about this whole substitutionary atonement thing. Okay. They they started to question. Um, whether it was people that needed to be reconciled with God or God that needed to be reconciled with people. Ooh, that's a turn of a phrase I've never heard before. So, so like something was off with God as opposed to something was off with people was the assertion? So the Universalists, there was a... Um, a really famous universalist named Hosea Ballou, who says, you know, this idea of an angry God who has to be appeased, we don't know this angry God who has to be appeased. God loves us. And so it's not that, it's not that there's this angry God who has to be reconciled with sinful humanity. It's that God loves us and people have to be brought back into relationship with God. And that was done when Jesus died by releasing that all abundant love into the world. That's really close to most Christian doctrine. Exactly. The, I, think, I think where 
Christian doctrine would differ would be uh, in saying God is a perfect unlimited being, that being which no greater being can be conceived of, must be perfect in his justice, perfect in his love. We see both of that in the scriptures. And so the justice is satisfied in the, in the sub, like, there is still justice. Like, justice is important. Like, somebody's going to answer for that Holocaust. It's just that those who participated in the Holocaust who are in Christ, it's Christ who answers for it. Those sins are dealt with there, as opposed to that judgment resting, that impossible to pay penalty on the heads of the people who participated in evil like that. I, I, that's a simple version of it. And so, and so I think the Christian would look at that and say, yes, at the cross we see the justice and love of God played out fully, and we see like, the culminating moment in God's redemptive plan. If I'm hearing you right, the universalist half of the Unitarian Universalist movement would say that the justice part is a misunderstanding of God's character and that mm -hmm. the love part is only further accentuated by the cross. Mm -hmm. am, I, yes. am I hearing properly? Yes. Okay. Right. So, so there are a couple ways to then interpret that, right? No one is... Um, God, God is always there and always loves you, right? No one... Um, is beyond God's love, um, and and sin is is the actions that people undertake that that keep themselves separate from God's love. Okay. Yeah. And and okay. so so no one is relegated to hell. So um, one one turn of phrase that's often used is that. In universalist churches, there is no hell. Um, there was, once upon a time, a controversy in universalist churches about whether or not people were, were simply saved and went straight to heaven, or if they had to atone for their actions in life before they went to heaven. So like a Catholic notion of purgatory. So there was, there was a controversy about that, okay. um, whether you had to be restored to or reconciled with God, um, that has kind of that that controversy um, never fully resolved itself, and um, later became kind of a moot point in in the further development of of the denomination. Um, so, so the the brief language right there is that you know God is love. And we are we are never separated from God's love except by our own actions. Mm -hmm. um, I think I mean I think that's historically Christian, right? Yes, like it is historically. All of sin and fall short yes. of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. That it's like right. basic Christian soteriology. So the failure of humanity within Christian theology isn't blamed on God. Mm -hmm. I mean, what Hebrews eight and nine speak to. Like, no, there was nothing wrong with God when people couldn't live up to the standards of the covenant. It was, it was people missing out on that stuff. So it seems like there's very similar language there. Um, God is love. And mm -hmm. said, sure, that's biblical. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we sang songs that said just only that. We didn't even sing mm -hmm. the songs that didn't have anything about his judgment when I was a kid in mm -hmm. church. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like the point of emphasis then is on... Um, the Christian position being, but the justice and the judgment thing, like there, there isn't the justice that we all want to see in that messianic language of the Old Testament without like, somebody paying for the shedding of blood and the violating of other people. The historical Christian position would be Jesus pays that for the Christian who does sin and does wrong. Mm -hmm. The universalist position would be... More along, think about the social gospel, right? Okay that we are redeemed by our actions in this life that bring God's love, that make God's love real in the world. Okay. There's, there's kind of an equation that I got taught as a kid. And I, I mean, I think it holds up Bible-wise for Christian soteriology. Okay, you got any amount of guilt makes you fundamentally other than a being with zero amount of guilt. Like, mm -hmm. like, a little bit imperfect is still imperfect as much as really imperfect is. The work of Christ is what redeems 
the really, really, really well-behaved sinner whose life looks absolutely impeccable from the outside, but is still flawed because you're human, as well as redeems the repentant, wildly flawed, violent, awful sinner. All of that can be dealt with in Christ. Forgiveness for all of that stuff. It's just effectively, you bend the knee to the king and you accept his his work as a sacrifice for your sins. I'm sure this is all familiar for you. You grew up with this. Um, so there's an equation in my brain, and I go, oh, okay, I get it. I just start here, and you got Jesus, and you got, okay, I get how it works. What is the equation for self-atonement? I'm sorry, I'm using all the wrong language here, but what is that, like how much good offsets the yuck? Is there, is there some kind of counsel or structure to that that can be offered for the person who comes to you and is like, all right, this makes sense to me. I want to do this. And I want atonement and redemption for the stuff that I've shanked in my mm -hmm. life. Here's what I've done. Is it like a, a Catholic confession where it's like, okay, this is what it would take to even that out? Or no. how does it work? So it, it works through relationship. Okay. Um, so there are lots of, right? So here's the interesting thing is that we're Unitarian Universalists. So there, the two things are theological definitions, right? About one is about who God is, and one is about how you're saved after death. Okay. And the history is that over time, these two denominations were um, really successful in the 17 and 1800s. And over time, both of them um, found that they became more and more liberal, um, had a more expansive understanding of God's love and welcome, um, and how people were responsible for making that real in the world. And each denomination hmm. um, changed in its theological composition um, with to small and varying degrees in individual congregations and such that they eventually reached a point in the 1950s where um, they realized that they had more in common than they had different. And to the point where the high school youth ahead of the adults went ahead and merged the high school youth program. Really? Like just like the student council? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Wow. Okay. Yes. I've never heard that as part of a denominational evolution, but I like it. So the, the teens did it first. Okay. And the adults said, yeah, we think this might be a good idea for us. And they then took 10 years to think about it. It's and very, study very it. Very adult like. Very adult like. And then voted on it. Very adult like. Yes. yes and, meetings. Right? And lots of meetings and eventually consolidated into a single denomination. And what they realized in that moment was they were coming with two different theological definitions. And the, the Universalists were Trinitarians. And the Unitarians were Unitarians, but had post-World War I and post-World War II become more and more humanist, right? Half of the original signers of the first Humanist Manifesto were Unitarian ministers. Okay, and just quickly, mm -hmm. humanism, we're talking like John Dewey and... Yes. Mm -hmm. um, John Haynes Holmes. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and this is first half of the 20th century? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I, I think I'm tracking with all of this. Okay. What I'm not tracking with is how do you put together a Trinitarian and a Unitarian? Yeah. Under, like it's, yeah. Like it feels like you're not talking about the same deity anymore. Like, like, Cause it's such a fundamental aspect of how that deity is defined. I'm surprised that 10 years was enough time for the adults to meet to well, figure that out. What was so that So you remember like? the part where they just kept getting more and more liberal? But you mean politically, you mean the, theologically, theologically, view of scripture, mm -hmm. things like that. Where okay. they, one of the things they did was they started to become less interested in um, doctrinal tests of belief, right? For the Unitarian churches um, 
have always had this history. Um, they, they come out of a long line of the traditional, the Congregationalist churches. And, um, and they have never had a test, uh, a, a doctrinal test in order to become a member. Okay. Um, and so... Do, just real quick, mm -hmm. what do you mean by uh, doctrinal test? You so, an of that. you know how you go to a traditional um, Christian church and you might say the Apostles' Creed? Sure, yeah, we do that. That's a doctrinal affirmation. Yeah, okay. There is no such thing in the history of the Unitarian Church. Okay. And for people who are sitting in our conversation who don't say the creeds in their church, they might have a statement of faith from Correct. their denomination. Correct. Or even a non-denominational church would usually have some, some kind, kind of, of statement of belief. We believe this stuff. Mm -hmm. And that would be a boundary marker in most traditions for membership, mm -hmm. full participation, or yeah. participation from the fringes. Mm -hmm. So you're saying there, there's nothing zero to affirm? Or like, does somebody have to affirm the existence of the deity or? We'll get there in a minute. The oh, point, I'm rushing us, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> right, the point is that um, membership was never limited based on belief. Okay. Okay. So complete outsider could be a member. Do members vote? Is there a congregational yes. polity? Yes, there is congregational polity. That looks like highly democratic or Highly more democratic. Hierarchy? Okay. So, so that's a lot of trust to vest in someone with your building, your finances, mm -hmm. your employees, your clergy without any kind of doctrinal test. I mean, did no that bite you in test. the butt or did it work? So what we do have is covenant. Ah, okay. Right. So in 1961, when the two merged, they said, you know what, we're never, you know, we're never going to actually have like 100% agreement on what exactly it is that we believe. And so rather than try and continue to hash this out, we are going to do away with any doctrinal or even any kind of belief, definition of belief. And we are going to open it, open it up. Okay. And rather than being bound by belief, we are bound in covenant. So a deal you make with each other more than a deal you make with a theological assertion. Correct. Okay. What does the deal look like? So there is a set of what are called principles that are, um, we, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote. And these principles have evolved over time, right? The originally there were just five or six, and then they have grown and, and changed over time. It's actually in the bylaws of the organization that they must be evaluated every so many years. Oh, I like auditing. Good. Yeah, okay. Do, do these still work? Mm -hmm. Is this still true to who we are? And the first one is the inherent worth and dignity of all people. The second is justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Third is um, the, uh, that we each, um, uh, that we respect everybody's um, uh, spiritual path and their yearning for meaning. Hmm. Okay. Um, then we have that you actually have a, you have a, uh, we affirm the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Okay. All right. Um, it's new language to me. So I'm having to yeah. buffer it up. I'm like, oh, okay. 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 We support the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process in our congregations and in society. Mm -hmm. Okay. We, um, uh, insist on a world of justice and freedom and um, uh, equity in the world, right? So we work for a, a world, a just world. Mm -hmm. And we respect the interdependent web of life of which we're all a part. Okay, here's what's interesting about that. Mm -hmm. you, I saw you glance down at my hands. I was trying to keep them off camera. I'm counting. I'm doing math. Yeah, there's seven. I saw you be like, wait a minute. What are you doing? 
Well, what I was doing is this hand was the, yeah, like obviously we'd want to qualify it and talk about exactly what we mean by the word mm -hmm. respect or, mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, even with the creeds, my church would say, all right, let's talk about that phrase there. We might not mean exactly the same thing, but yeah, that's Christian, we're Christian. There were five of those you said that, yeah, you know, I'm ready to go right now. I'm not even that good at the Bible. I'm like, yeah, I, oh, I got that. That's all mm -hmm. over the place. Old Testament, mm -hmm. New Testament, teaching of Christ, writing of Paul. Five of those are immediately evident to me. And even some of the more conservative, even fundamentalist aspects of things I was around when I was a kid, even there, mm -hmm. I definitely got taught all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. like even the most... Even I would call them fundamentalists, even the most fundamentalist Bible teachers and stuff I had at little private school, man, they would have affirmed all of that. Mm -hmm. yeah, justice, um, decency, rightness, compassion, mm -hmm. inclusion for people who are different from mm -hmm. you. Um, not all of the Bible articulates Athenian style democracy or like, like there's, that's one of the places where you need to caveat it a little bit. I, I could imagine many just ways to arrive at just governance, but like if you can do it, I mean, human yeah. participation. So, right, the arrival at, at, at just governance is the idea that um, if every person is saved, right, if every single person is saved, they, every single person has inherent worth and dignity, thus every single person gets a vote and a voice. Whereas I think the historical Christian position would nuance it slightly and say everyone's dignity comes from being created in the image of God and that uh, they have dignity and value regardless of relationship to the church or status of salvation mm -hmm. simply by merit of being image bearers. So, so again, like, yeah, yeah, it's a zip code. I certainly see the overlap. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple where I like put them on this hand. So I'm like, okay, more nuancing, but there's overlap there mm -hmm. and I can see it. it the point is, I, a whole lot of that sounds very, very, very historically Christian. Mm -hmm. And well, I could certainly see places where I would look at church I've been around and expressions of Christianity where I go like, all right, it might say that on paper, but the execution's a little wanting here, here, here. Um, to me, I'm, I'm surprised at how much overlap there is in those basic principles. So it sounded like one of the real key cogs, if I'm hearing you right, is that idea that for the Unitarian Universalist, that no hell, um, emphasis on God's love apart from his judgment and therefore the universal salvation of all people, mm -hmm. that, that really informs the human dignity element. Mm -hmm. Whereas you know, the, the raw image of God upon people informs the human dignity element in historical Christianity. Slight wrinkle that maybe takes us in slightly different directions. And even more so. So you're still looking at this with a Christian lens. Oh, heck yeah. Like unapologetically. <laughs> right. And so for the Unitarian Universalists, the lens is whatever each individual comes with. So we have atheists, agnostics, Buddhists, Hindus, pagans, theists, deists, like all of the above, people who are, don't have a definition for what they are, mm -hmm. Jews, you know, all, whatever um, you experience to be true in the world is the lens that you bring. And so you can then look and say, I'm a humanist. I don't believe in God. I don't think there is a God, but I still, you know, understand that by nature of being a human on this planet, we all have inherent worth and dignity. Yeah. And, and I would say the same as a classical liberal. Mm -hmm. like if, I, if I get to a point where I'm like, I don't think there's a God anymore, I, I still think it's self-evident from human existence 
that people have worth and dignity yes. and self-ownership right. of their bodies mm-hmm. and the things that they make. Mm-hmm. And so for me, the, the starting point of public morality is not, it's not even really God said these things or this is how church ought to be. Well, I share a planet with a whole bunch of people who yeah. either don't regard that text as being from God or read it differently. Right. Mm-hmm. It seems we have to have a different starting point for morality. And it sounds like we're in the same zip code on that starting point for mm-hmm. public human morality. That mm-hmm. being, there's something unique about you. You're not just yes. another piece of matter or material that got flung yes. together in the universe. Mm-hmm. You're a human and that has intrinsic value. Mm-hmm. And I think that chair doesn't have self-ownership, but you have self-ownership. Right. So if I violate the chair, it's not the crime against the chair that's the problem. The problem is somebody owns that. Right. And they use their life and their energy to get it and make it part of what they're doing. And for me to violate that chair is effectively for me to disregard your value as a person. And so morality can flow out from there. And it sounds like that's a place where we've got yes. shaded area in the Venn diagram. Well, and right, the idea of being a covenantal faith, right? Our covenant is not with God. Oh, wow. Our covenant yeah. is with each other. Yeah, and you know how that strikes my ears. Like I hear, oh, covenantal. Okay, so you know, kind of uh, Calvinist, but you fall into this place in the 17th century. But when you use that term, it's entirely horizontal. Yep. Yeah, it's going to take a while for the wheels to spin properly for me on that. That's new. So even... Right. A lot of people look at the seven principles and they're like, oh, this is a statement of belief. And it's not right. The language was we covenant, we the member congregation. So it's not even that your individual members have to agree to this. It's that as a congregation, we affirm and promote these values. We as a congregation promise to behave this way and promote these ideals in our communities. Okay. So so somebody theoretically could reject all seven principles. Like I don't think people have intrinsic value. I don't think the democratic if they, representation is an extension, but I can cooperate with you and I will mm-hmm. live under these terms. Mm-hmm. That is exactly how we do it. Exactly. I, we... So when we bring on members, and mm-hmm. it's so interesting to hear your timeline, because it's like I'm 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 going through two parallel ways that things could have worked <laughs> out. Super quick version. I don't want to bore you with my stuff. I'm here to learn about your stuff, but I think this is neat. So my credentialing and education are in the Evangelical Free Church of America. Most mm-hmm. people don't know what that is, but you know, for a time it was the fastest growing. Uh, biblical Christian denomination, like it it was cooking in the 90s and 2000s, still doing pretty well. Uh, It's a pretty uh, life of the mind, Christian tradition, church history discipline, but theologically evangelical with room for some reformed stuff that's there and um, historically classically liberal, Mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, very northern. Scandinavian. Well, the Norwegians and the Swedes both have a Lutheran state church. Mm. They both say, we don't think the government should make people pay tithes. Mm -hmm. And they go through a process in the 19th century of breaking away. Then, you know, Minnesota Vikings, there's a reason that's the mascot. Mm -hmm. People from those two countries move to the the northern Midwest and gradually they figure out, oh, oh, like the Spider-Man meme, like, (laughs) hey, you're the same thing. And, and they merge. Mm-hmm. And when they put it together, they're dealing with kind of the same sort of question that the Unitarian Universalists had to deal with, which is, it's going to, just read the room. It's 1950. It's going to take a little bigger umbrella here. Yeah. They could see where it was going. And so the free in free church initially meant free from state control. Mm. Mm-hmm. But then in the Evangelical Free Church of America, it also kind of came to mean as the world is getting smaller, we've got to craft this umbrella with only those theological essentials and we have to have a theological mechanism for what happens if someone wants to be in but still has the natural human freedom of conscience and curiosity on a question as big as life, death, God, faith, that maybe Maybe they're still going to ask a question about the Bible or what happens in the end of time or 
mm-hmm. how somebody goes to heaven or what the Holy Spirit is. So it's a, what they came up with was a very succinct statement that doesn't have that weird extra point that you normally get like, oh, that's the one. That's why you split. I get it. It doesn't have that. I find that really appealing because they were facing some of the same historical mm-hmm. pressures that I think Unitarian Universalists were. And so the solution that my tradition came up with was very big tent, boil it down to theological essentials, but with the caveat that the membership vow or whatever that we use is, can you live in harmony Mm -hmm. with this? Mm -hmm. It isn't, can at the deepest level of your essence, at your truest self, and you will tell us if it changes. Do you believe this? Do you think all of that 100% as it's intended by us who wrote it at all times? I just think it's interesting that that same, the same set of pressures created two different responses, but right. both of which allow for that reality that I think some earlier expressions of church didn't, which is the process you talked about at the right. very beginning. Yes, You might not always think all the same right. things at the same level of certitude, right. because you got five senses and you're taking in data and you're thinking, and the Bible's a very large book, and church history is a very long story. Yes, And so I, I really resonate with what you're saying that it's a covenant but it's a covenant that you need to live in community that you can that you can play nice with um yeah. as opposed to think 100 percent all the time and and most congregations also have an individual church covenant tell me about that so we have a, a covenant here in our congregation which is about how we behave together as the first unitarian church of st louis toward each other and toward the community yep Okay. Mm-hmm. What's in that? It's a really long document. What I are the high points that you it. really like? <laughs> well, that um, that that we gather in fellowship, that we are here to love and support one another and each other's spiritual journeys and to work for um, you know, the the greater future of our community here in St. Louis and yeah. yeah. So Yes, 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 right? Like yes. That, that, and so for us, we would put that in maybe like a mission statement. It's kind of a trendy thing people started saying. Sure, and we have a mission statement as well. The covenant also includes things, you know, specific behavioral guidelines. Like what to do if people get crossways with each other? Yes, and you know, if you threaten someone, then you are out of alignment with the church covenant. I would hope so. <laughs> so is, it, is that informed by the famous Matthew 18 passage in terms of what order you deal with a gripe with another person in, or is it another mechanism entirely for what you do when you get crossways with somebody? It's another mechanism entirely. Okay. What does it look like? So it looks like um, it varies depending on the situation and, um, and the severity of the crossways. Okay. Right. So if the so, crossways is you gossiped about me and my feelings are hurt. Then I would sit down and do a, a mediated listening process okay. with two parties. Um, you know, if, if it was um, uh, you sexually harassed someone, that's not, I would not sit down and do a mediated listening process with two parties. Okay. Um, so you're also going to look at like power differentials. You know, or but you would verify that yes. there was veracity to the, yes. the charge. Yes, I would, mm-hmm. yeah. and and I would not be the only person involved in that process. Yeah, <laughs> you're a KG veteran, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> Good, that's smart. That's um, uh, so so the the and right and and the kind of body that would do that process is a right relations committee right we're always okay. looking at are we in right relationship yeah um and if we're not how do we reconcile with one another is reconciliation possible when it's not mm-hmm. like somebody violates trust in such a way that it can't be fixed um what's the process for severing ties with them. So 
it's essentially that um, it, if you can operate within the bounds of our covenant, you are welcome to be in community. And if you cannot, then there are various levels of restriction on participation. Okay. We've talked about the principles, mm -hmm. which is our covenant. Okay. What we haven't yet touched on is when the Unitarians and the Universalists said, we're not going to be bound by a statement of belief, and we are open to whatever people arrive at as their personal understanding. Um, it also opened up our sources for wisdom and truth in the world. You mean beyond? Beyond the Bible. Bible. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so we also have a statement about what are the sources from which we draw that wisdom and truth and meaning from the world. Is the Bible still on the list? The Bible is still on the list. It, okay. is, it comes as the Jewish and Christian teachings that profess the love of God. So, so that means that we're thinking of the Old Testament, the New Testament separately then. Yes. So do we go with a Jewish canon of the Old Testament or Sometimes. Like a Catholic Septuagint canon of the Old Testament? So the amazing thing, right? So the, the first thing that we name is um, the, the words and deeds of prophetic people. Okay. Right? So that means that we can find truth and meaning from the words and deeds of MLK or Mahatma Gandhi. Zoroaster? If the case is, okay. right? Um, we also um, find truth and wisdom in the transcendent experience of wonder and mystery in the world. Okay. We um, find wisdom in the world's religions and philosophies and teachings. Um, so that includes, right, the whole spectrum of world religions. Um, but not all the elements ever. Like, like, correct. For example, I could imagine that there would be a ton about Islam that would overlap value-wise with what you're mm -hmm. saying. Certainly there are expressions of extremely fundamentalist Islam or Christianity mm -hmm. or uh, even extremely fundamentalist expressions of Hinduism that don't sound like they would be particularly compatible. So it's, it's not a wholesale adoption. Correct. Okay. Correct. So then the matrix would just be, does this aspect of your religion square with our understanding? Mm -hmm. And you're giving yourself permission to co-opt and make use of those things. We try not still... to co-opt. We try to teach them within the framework of that religion and oh, culture. Okay. Right. Now, I wasn't using co-opt as a pejorative, but I understand why you're making the distinction. Right. Okay. Um, we don't want to just wholesale take things from other people's religions. And, right, we're not syncretic, right? We're not trying to okay. create something new from what other people have already done. So you're not trying to synthesize a whole bunch of things down. That, that's more the impulse of Baha'i. Mm -hmm. is a, a very dramatic synthesizing, and I don't right. totally understand the mechanisms by which right. they make that work. You're talking about a, a partial affirmation as, as you understand it to be true within the context of Islam. So those things that are true about Islam, right. you would treat about true as, as true about Islam within Islam, right. with some transcendent timelessness beyond that. Correct, that would bring meaning to us as Unitarian Universalists as well. Okay. Right. So, so the matrix then would just be, does it square or does it not? Like if it's not helpful, it's okay to mm -hmm. leave yes. that there. Yes. Okay. Um, we're also looking, as I said, at the Jewish and Christian teachings. Uh, and we're also using reason and science and um what christians would call natural revelation 
Mm-hmm. And from the order of things and the, the, order the of abstract things. and the physical. And also, um, right, the understanding that that as we know new things, our beliefs might change, right? And and that um, the use of reason that is our responsibility to think through for ourselves. Um, and then um, the 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 teachings of earth based spirituality and indigenous traditions. Was that six? Did I count out six? I can. I, I was keeping track of my counted. fingers before, and I lazily didn't <laughs> when we needed it. I let us down. Okay, okay. So, uh, so what are those those holy texts or prophetic writings? Um, I, having the, the humanist roots on the universalist side of mm-hmm. the equation, it seems like those needn't be connected necessarily to the divine in your context then. Right. They could just be the best humanity has to offer. Correct. Okay. And th- does that list change over time? Like ideas obviously come in and out of vogue. Right. Or ideas that like really made sense once. Like for example, I know this is delicate, but I'm just going to do yeah, it because yeah. we've done so well so far. So, for example, like Margaret Sanger yep. makes a lot of sense in one context. Right. Eugenics look a lot less hot after World War II. Right. And so maybe that's somebody who might appear on a list curated this way at one point, but then you have Correct. that caveat of we grow, we think, we Correct. learn. It's not on the list anymore. Correct. Yeah. So um, there was a period in time has in the history of of the denomination when, yes, the work of Margaret Sanger and I didn't know that. I was like, yes. like throwing out wild examples. I do not want you to think that I like calculated that up <laughs> to try to got you. I, I did not know that. Well, what this teaches, right, is, is that we grow and develop with new information. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and now we understand the the horror of a thought process like eugenics Mm -hmm. and how it denies the inherent worth and dignity of others. And so we would not promote that work now. Um, And there, there is, you know, historic documentation of that work being supported in the past. Within Unitarian Universalism. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I did not know that. So yes, the list does change over time, and the list is growing and added to on a regular basis, right? We have the whole world of literature and art and science to draw upon. We have the holy scriptures of the world's traditions to draw upon. we have the history of thought to draw upon, mm-hmm. um, which can make worship planning incredibly challenging. Because you have all of it? We have all of it. Yeah, I have to admit, that is something that I never faced in preparation for a worship service. <laughs> like, well, what should I draw from the Kama Sutra today? Like, it just, that doesn't occur to you as an evangelical free church minister. <laughs> right? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, w- what is those sacred texts Mm -hmm. that you're drawing on that, um, you know, the Quran, Mm -hmm. the New Testament, Mm -hmm. where adherence to the religions associated with those texts would say, this is inspired by God. This isn't of human origin. Mm -hmm. This is God's revelation. The story behind the Muslim belief of how that revelation occurred is Uh different than the New Testament, but but both believe it's from God through the mechanism that they believe it's through. Do you retain any of that, or would you view those as as purely human creations that somehow, through the human quest to experience the divine, point us toward the divine? More of the second, right? Where a lot of our understanding of sacred text is that it's filtered through human understanding, and so they are they are documents of human creation. They may be divinely inspired. Um, and they have wisdom for us to learn from, um, but we understand them as existing within a framework of human mediation. What about the Book of Mormon? Is that is that on the list, or is that 
kind of in on the relegated side where it's like, ah, it just what it teaches takes us to weird places. So we try not to weigh in on um, where um, where other people's traditions um, make fantastical claims or I don't like that language at all. It, well, that's why I asked about <laughs> that's why I asked about the Book of Mormon though is because it mm -hmm. it's it's a it's a quandary for what you're saying. It, it, I, I picked it because it would be a bit of a fly in the ointment. And I was curious as a test case for how do you wrestle through that? Because the origin story is tricky. Mm -hmm. It's born out of a tricky moment mm -hmm. with some tricky stuff that comes with it that some could view as baggage, other mm -hmm. could, view, could view as exemplary and, and great. But if we're talking about the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita or the New Testament or the mm -hmm. Old Testament, mm -hmm. it's pretty easy for me to see how what I'm learning about universal, uh, universal, Unitarian Universalism mm -hmm. could be like, oh yeah, it works because of this. Whereas something much more recent and with this claim surrounding it, like I could see how that one would still maybe be in what do we do with this purgatory a little bit. And our, right, my, my approach as a minister is to, is to, to take teachings and see where they are in alignment with our Unitarian Universalist principles okay. and what they have to teach us about living in alignment with those principles. And so um, I, with, with all of the, you know, world's sources available, um, am less inclined to approach a text that um, I don't have clarity on yet. Hmm. Um, and you're allowed to, you're not obligated, like anything that anybody holds out is sacred, you're not obligated correct. to incorporate. Okay. Correct. Okay. Yeah, and I suppose if you got 11 trillion things that you can draw on, mm -hmm. you're gonna gravitate toward the things where you feel more contextual clarity within your convictions. Yeah. It makes sense. Is sin a concept that exists in Unitarian Universalism? Or is Great that a question. Christian concept that didn't make the trip? That's a question that a lot of people ask. And it's, um, I, I, my experience would be that most people, members in the pews, um, may or may not have a concept of sin. Um, as a minister, I definitely have a concept of sin. And sin is those actions and choices that put us out of relationship with those in our communities and in the world. So I, um, uh, every minister has their own personal set of beliefs. Okay. Just as every single member of the congregation has their own set of beliefs. We have the same responsibility as our members to, to determine our own understanding of truth. And so um, I identify both as a humanist and as a process theologian. Okay. And so as a process theologian, um, I, my, my, Right, a lot of process theology is based in Christianity and, and this idea of making God real in the world and how, you, how um, we co-create with the divine. And as a humanist, my process theology is more rooted in how do we co-create with each other and how do we make heaven here on earth, right? I'm not so interested in the afterlife. I'm much more interested in what are we doing in this life 
to bring about the beloved community. And um, where was I going with that? <laughs> Sounds like the San Junipero episode of Black I Mirror. I love that episode! With the Belinda Carlisle song and everything. Oh, yeah. Like that, it, like I watched that and I thought, this is religious, what yes. they're doing here. I'm not sure what religion this is born out of. Sure. But I think whoever wrote this episode, which for people who haven't watched it, is effectively uh, uh, people going through the process of socially and technologically creating an expression of heaven mm -hmm. perpetually mm -hmm. in the world, which mm -hmm. was both intriguing, scary, fascinating, felt like I was listening. It obviously made an impression because I brought it up. So when you said that, it's, it's weird, Mike. My mind went to what felt like the only positively framed episode of Black Mirror in the entire <laughs> run. But I had a feeling you'd know that one. I know that one. All right. Um, and the Belinda Carlisle song. Of course. All right. Well, yes. I, we graduated from school the same year, so I'd expect you to right? know it. Um, so, 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 okay, so within this framework of um, relationality, mm -hmm. right? Sin is those behaviors that denies the inherent worth and dignity of others or the planet and causes a separation in the greater relationality. So, so theft would be sin then because oh, it absolutely. violates... Is it a is it a mortal sin? Oh, you have that. <laughs> no, we don't. Okay, I was like, oh, that's so Catholic. <laughs> oh, we're gonna need to block out another hour. Okay, and and obviously violation of another person's body, physically, yeah. sexually, mm -hmm. that would be absolutely that would be sin. Yeah. Um. So so in that sense, it sounds like it fits within a classical liberal framework of the starting point for morality and law. Mm -hmm. is self-ownership yeah but i'm really interested in in what you said earlier i've never heard it put that way or thought about it that way and that is i'm gonna get it wrong i'm gonna have to ask you to correct me um that sin is that which creates division within the covenant or division mm -hmm. between people mm -hmm. is that i mean is that universal or, or so like, let's say, for example, um, our mutual friend Ted just can't get enough of heroin. It just that's what he's into. He knows it's probably not the best idea, but he does it. And I look at Ted and I'm like, you're my friend and your life's going off the rails. And I'm putting my foot down. You got to stop with the heroin. You got to get help. You got to do something about this. And Ted's like, nah, up yours. I really like heroin. And no. Where is the sin? Because now we have division between mm -hmm. us mm -hmm. and like maybe serious division mm -hmm. between us. Did sin occur in that equation or are we talking about something else there? You're talking about something else there. Okay. Right, so the sin that happened there is whatever separation or hurt that um, brought your friend to the point where his answer was heroin. Hmm. Um, there's a lot of science right now that's looking at the role of community and connection in recovery. And um, what does it mean to um, provide, um, I mean, I'm going to say it again, connection. Okay. Um, and, and that can look like a lot of things. Um, but boundaries are not the same thing as disconnection. Okay. Right, so your friend is asserting a boundary, which is, I cannot be in relationship with you while you are on heroin. That's a boundary. Your friend isn't saying you no longer have inherent worth and dignity because you take heroin. Okay. Right? So the disconnection, when I say disconnection, I'm saying that you're denying someone's part in 
humanity, right? You're denying someone's inherent worth and dignity. You're denying that they are part of the world and that they deserve to be here. Okay, so we're getting into like the Matthew 7 stuff then. The don't judge lest you will be judged. That's immediately followed by don't throw your pearls before a swine. Well, how do you know who the swine are? You judge. So there's, there's some kind of extreme that Jesus would seem to be talking about there between the wholesale condemnation of the soul and value of another person versus even though the language of swine and dog sounds very harsh to us now, identifying someone who has malicious intent mm -hmm. and not putting the, like all things that are beautiful in front of them to behave darkly. Right, with. right. So let me ask another scenario then. I'm double clicking on this because I think it's, I think it's a key point of distinction and it's very clearly a key point of how this whole system works. So on the sin thing, um, let's go with politics. Okay. Let's say one person voted for Jill Stein, like really believes in the Green Party ideology, and another person is standard issue, blue Democrat. They voted for Joe Biden. Okay. And they cannot reconcile it. Like, okay. It's angry over the division in policies. Uh, Biden not serious enough about climate stuff. A Green Party candidate would have been serious about that. And it builds up. It boils over at church or at Thanksgiving. Sure. Like we know the anatomy of this kind of a breakup, mm -hmm. right? The, yep. The, the now we're so mean to each other, we can't disagree anymore fight. Uh -huh. And it escalates to that level. Mm -hmm. now you could argue, everybody's got a point. Like, look, you just voted for a candidate, whatever. But, but now we really do get to that point where people are starting to say to each other, you voted wrong. I know why you voted wrong. And you're whatever term you want to use. You're mm -hmm. anathema to me and mm -hmm. should be to everyone. Like it's escalated. In, in that scenario, has sin occurred? And if so, where did the sin occur that caused that division? So my question it is always when, when it gets into the realm of talking about, you know, what is political is to look at um, what is affirming of humanity and in which case that is not political. No, that's human. Right, that's human. And so we may disagree on how, what policies are the best way to affirm people's humanity. Um, but if we can agree that um, on the, the basic human rights of people, those are not political. Um, so I don't know when you walked in, if you noticed our, the two flags that hang in the front of our congregation. Yeah. You had, uh, no, I, I think I've seen an evolution in the one flag since yeah. the expression you have hanging here, but it looks like, a like last summer, um, LGBTQ flag yeah so we have a, a black pride, lives matter we have, flag, a right? we have a progress pride flag progress pride mm -hmm. okay forgive me for not getting the terminology You're fine. quite right um and yeah we have a black lives matter flag so both of those flags some people consider those political statements for us they are a statement about who is included in the human family and um you know we we recognize that that not all people exist in a world of equity. Mm -hmm. And so um, choices around achieving equity are not political decisions on, from our perspective, right? So our goal, um, one of the pieces of our mission statement is this idea of advancing justice. We may disagree on how you advance justice. Yes. Um, but we want the justice 
and equity for all. But I would, I have not gotten the vibe from you once that as someone who agrees on everything you just said, wants the exact same thing, has put a ton of energy into it, but would never put up a Black Lives Matter flag that I'm bad or in sin or an outsider to you. I just, I don't agree that that organization is the best way to achieve its stated goals. Yeah, I that's... think the best way would be the free market. I think involving people in building equity, building ownership of their own stuff. I, I can point to evidence that I find compelling, others might not, that says, that has been the most justice giving thing in the history of the world, mm -hmm. though not perfect. It's the least unjust system that I can point to as a historian, so I'm really high on it. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I'm a Christian, and I don't want people to live in poverty, and I don't want people to suffer, mm -hmm. and I do want equity. I want everybody in the game. I think it reduces crime. I think it increases peace. Mm -hmm. I think it makes new friends that yeah. you couldn't have before. So for me, any policy that precludes a person from full participation mm -hmm. in the freedom, the freedom of movement, freedom of thought, freedom of ideas, I'm willing to go to war to put an end to that. Mm -hmm. For me, what, what looks to me like more Marxist underpinnings to, to BLM causes me to say, okay, I'm rooting for you where we agree on the same outcome. I hope mm -hmm. your approach works. I, don't think that's as likely to work as this other idea, but we want the same thing. So I can high five over that, even if I'm, I wouldn't, even if I'd say the name of your group with enthusiasm in total agreement, and even if I want the exact same outcomes, I get a different strategy. Now, some would say, well, then we just can't be friends. But, but you knew who I was before I came. Mm -hmm. I mean, you did homework on yeah. what I put on the internet and what I do, and you still let me come and sit with you. Mm -hmm. So it would seem that there's a pretty clear Unitarian Universalist um, theological mechanism for hanging out with people who might agree on the objectives but don't agree on the strategy. Absolutely. And, and so I saw the flags and I thought, actually two things. I thought those are theological and those are political. And it can be both. Mm -hmm. And I thought, uh, theologically, should the groups represented in these flags be treated with the utmost respect, human dignity, created in the image of God? Well, yeah, it's the starting point of my morality and mm -hmm. the starting point of the human side of my faith. Do I agree with all things politically or that those political ends represented by those flags will achieve the stated goals? No, I got a different strategy, but I want, I want the same thing. Yeah, and so I think there's a couple things that come to mind. So what's been interesting to me is that some people see the, the Black Lives Matter flag and interpret it as a statement of alignment with the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah, oh, I certainly did. I mean, I wasn't appalled, but I certainly read it that way. Um, and I think for us, it's a statement of affirmation about okay. Black Lives Matter. Yep. Um, and With no caveat. Just Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because for us, they are a theological statement. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and it is not always clear um, where and what kind of welcome different churches espouse. Um, you know, churches for a long time um, had been places of exclusion for the LGBTQ community. And, um, and churches for a long time um, were part of the oppression of people of color. And so um, to, be, to make clear theological statements about who we understand to be included in the human community is why those flags are up there. Yeah, yeah, and, and also the liberators of people of color. Yes. Who are, I mean, it, both are so true. So if I'm hearing you right then, the hanging of that flag is not meant to communicate to someone like me who would say, agree, 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 agree. Strategically, I'm on a different page, but I, I'm on board. I want the same, the same outcomes. It wouldn't be meant to say, hey, look, if you don't like the, the economic underpinnings of this particular expression of this movement, this wouldn't be the place for you. 
It's meant to say, hey, we affirm the dignity of all people. Yeah. And we know that stuff means stuff. And in this context, this particular flag, perfections and imperfections that come with all flags, is a way we can communicate to our community who we are and that Correct. we affirm their inherent value as people created in the image of God. That's my that image in God. That's your that's language, mine. yes, absolutely, yes. yes. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I think that's enormously clarifying. And thank you for not being weirded out by talking <laughs> about that with an outsider. It's hanging on the building where my name is also out front. Yeah, I, I have to be able to talk front. about these yes, things, absolutely. right? Like, if I can't talk about it, then why? I have no business serving in a church where it's hanging out there. <laughs> so is there a heaven in Unitarian Universalism? Is there for a some thing people. that happens after? For some people. So if there is a heaven, mm -hmm. the Universalist thing would say everybody is mm -hmm. in. But there might not be? Like, what do you think? Do you think there's a heaven? I don't have an answer to that. I am, as I said before, way more interested in what we're doing right here and right now. So when my grandfather died, I went to his memorial service. And as part of the eulogy, the minister said, the role of religion is to help you know where you go when you die. Hmm. And I said, I completely disagree with that. Hmm. For me, the role of religion is to make meaning of what happens here on earth and to give me tools for living in relationship with those around me. Hmm. At which point you say, is that religion? Well, no, I hadn't said that, but now that you <laughs> raised the question. Okay, let me ask, is that religion? So it is religion in that it is giving me a foundation for how I understand the world to be. Okay. Um, and so I don't have an answer for what happens when we die. Mm. And when I pastor people who are dying, what I do is I talk to them about what they believe and what they understand to be true. And so if someone tells me that they believe in God and God loves them and they are looking forward to being reconciled with God in the afterlife, then I'm going to affirm that for them. Um, I, I don't have a reason to deny their understanding of the truth. Mm -hmm. And as a pastor, I'm there for that person. It's not about me. And so um, what, I, what I want to do is to, in that moment, as I am there with that person, to be in relationship and connection. Do you hope there's a heaven? Do I hope there's a heaven? If heaven is to be at one with nature, then yes. Because I don't have an answer, I don't spend too much time worrying about it. Um, there are so many other things happening in the world for me to spend my time thinking about. Um, yeah. Well, that, I mean, that certainly, it helps frame up the question of salvation. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are a bunch of people watching this who, if you press them, they'd say they're some expression of Christian, mm -hmm. historical, vaguely Orthodox Christian or super Orthodox Christian. And I think at this point in our conversation, they're going, okay, that, that's helpful. Now I'm understanding it. Because for them, and for me, the question of salvation is a very important one. Like 
I think humanity has a problem. I think the problem is, is beyond political. I think it's at the soul. Um, I, I think we can't help ourselves. I, I, nobody lives a clean life. And because of that, and because, um, you know, as even we've talked, there, there isn't a neat, tidy equation for how you unmake the stuff that you've made. Right. Uh, is it two to one ratio, five to one, ten to one? Is there even a ratio? I mean, I don't know. It's very hard to figure out. So because I, I believe the Bible thing, nobody's righteous, not even one, do righteous things, but inherently we're flawed. So because of that, the question of salvation becomes important. Well, what fixes the broken stuff? How's that atoned for? How Am I forgiven for that? Can it ever go away? Or is it just an albatross that I wear until the end of time? And that question of salvation going from this state of for the Christian partial union with God in this life and full union with God and, and what happens next, the question of how do you go from this to that becomes very pressing. Mm -hmm. Whereas if the theological system doesn't necessitate or say with certitude anything about heaven and, and sin is primarily a, and correct me if I'm wrong on any of this because I want to, I'm repeating it to understand it, if sin is primarily a communal violation so not an affront to God, right. but a violation of human unity, mm -hmm. then, then it helps me understand why salvation doesn't keep coming up in our conversation because there, there isn't one. Like, saved from what, I suppose, would be the question. Is there, is there any overlap between the Christian notion of salvation and the Unitarian Universalist so... theology of process? We have Christian Unitarian Universalists. Okay. Right, and so those folks do have an understanding of heaven and sin and um, a belief structure that is compatible with liberal Christianity. Okay. Right, so... Um, so when you when you asked about sin, um, our framework as a denomination, right, would um, talk about you know being in covenant or out of covenant um, horizontally. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And everybody's also got their personal definitions of sin, right? When, when you open up to each person's understanding of truth and meaning, they, they bring all of that theological framework of their own determining with them. I think I already know the answer to this in light of everything you just said, but do you have to believe in God to be a Unitarian Universalist? Nope. So that atheism is not transient when you list uh, atheists attend. We have about 50% of our congregation identifies as some kind of humanist or atheist. And they say the prayers in your worship service? Mm -hmm. What are those prayers like? So <clears throat> I pray from my own, right? So every minister is responsible for leading prayers from their own theological understanding. Okay. And so um, we lead prayers and um, people don't necessarily, de it does depend on the prayer, but they don't necessarily um, recite prayers with you. Um, but I invite people into a spirit of prayer and I often use language um, spirit of life and love, holy within and among us. Uh, and then I may expand upon it, um, depending on what situation I'm in. Um, I may say great mystery. Um, oh, in reference to what, where we would put deity. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how I would, would begin a prayer or address a prayer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And so, so to the, the atheist congregant, is that, 
personal meditation. I mean, because you're not praying to anyone. So mm -hmm. to the void, to oneself, to the community, where, where are those, where do you yeah. instruct those thoughts to be directed? What do you do with it? Yeah, so, so prayer is an act of focus and attention. Um, it can be um, an act of gratitude or an act of lament. Um, but for us as Unitarian Universalists, with in that kind of corporate worship model, right, where we're all in here together, you know, versus individual prayer, right? What we're doing is giving voice to what is present in the community and um, our experience and our hopes. Um, not in some ways, not unlike an intention, but um, a mindful presence with ourselves and whatever it is that we find meaningful. So for someone who is an atheist, it would be, you know, being in thoughtful attention and articulating that which is on their heart. Um, if you identified as a theist, um, you know, you would be giving voice to these prayers to God. Um, what we're what we're trying to do is to create um, a, a container for a multiplicity of beliefs. And so that can sometimes mean using language that is accessible to all and sometimes mean using very specific language with the understanding that we may use very specific language that is meaningful to someone else in another minute. Hmm. Right. So, so there's a little bit of endurance in the worship service for one. It's like, ah, yes. okay, here we go with the Hindu stuff. All right, well, they sat through my thing. I guess. Is that mm -hmm. part of the, the vibe? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay. Right, I mean, uh, you know, you talk about sitting and talking to folks who don't, whose the theological process, you're like, wow, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if I would agree with that. Um, that can happen in our pews, hmm. right? Where, where people are like, huh, I don't know if I agree with that, but I really like so and so, and you know, we operate in this shared community and we're both on spiritual journeys and we respect each other's individual journeys. Like, that is Sunday morning in our congregation. Okay. Yeah, and that is all the rest of the time in ours. So like, th that would also happen in the pews of the church that I attend, but the service, like, it's obviously going to be fully creedal, recite the creeds, right. you know, Christian prayers. And so, I mean, that that's a significant difference, though, that mm -hmm. both places, the wildest conversations and the most patience, tolerance, acceptance of where somebody else is at in their journey would occur. But here, you're in inviting to try and find a way to build that into a worship service yes. that could accommodate yeah. such divergent understandings or contexts yeah. and I have got to think that makes your preparation week very creative. It does, uh, right? Sometimes it's fun and sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, I have a headache. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah. Um, well, okay, I have a question about the God thing mm -hmm. and you don't have to answer it, but I'm super curious because you're the only Unitarian Universalist I've ever had a lengthy conversation with. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a God? Do I think there's a God? Is that a simplistic question? No, it's a super complicated question. Because um, I 
understand that when most people say God, they mean big G supernatural being beyond myself. Maker of all things. And if I am going to talk about God, I'm really curious about the spark of the holy that exists in everyone and everything. And I'm really um, drawn to this idea also of God as a symbol for um, change in the world, which doesn't mean that God is a being or even an energy, but a recognition of something that has happened. Um, I, I do not have a belief in a supernatural being. Okay. I do have an experience of the divine that is in each and every one. Do you think there's any externality to that spark of the divine that was somehow woven into people? Or is that spontaneously generated from inside of the physical world as meaning is assigned mm. to the physical world? I think, I think it's inherent in our existence. Um, and one of our tasks is to give it expression. It's a very thin shaded area between us on this point because mm -hmm. obviously my conception of deity as a creedal historical Christian is wildly different and more specific. And obviously I would enthusiastically say, no, there is no spark of divinity from within us that is self-generated or self-realized. That spark of divinity, if we if we use that language, is I mean, it's from the greatest being that could ever conceivably be imagined by the most thoughtful thought that could ever be put into it, who made all things and is right. pre-existent in three persons and and language that just would not occur here. Right. But um but where that little tiny shaded area, I think, exists between what we're saying is that idea of, uh, I guess, what we would call the light of the world. Mm -hmm. Matthew 5, those principles that Jesus lays out in his first big public announcement of some of his plan and the Sermon on the Mount. He gets to the end of the Beatitudes, the, the beautiful values of the kingdom that I would guess yes. resonate here yeah, across the absolutely. board. Yeah. And then he gets into that stuff about you know a, a light or a city on a hill and... Salt of the earth, this idea of a preservative that there is some kind of recognition of, um, of the, the beauty and, and luminance of the things of God and the values of his kingdom cannot be hidden, is how a Christian would, would mm -hmm. read that. Mm -hmm. And so there's that, that shaded area is small, but it's there. The difference would be maybe in where we would suppose that that luminance comes from. Right. And he's saying that's very intentionally put in place by a very personal being who very intentionally does it, despite the fact that he knew that we would wreck it and go astray, and then he bends over backwards to redeem it. You saying that there is something, um, I think, inherent. What's the word that you use? It is, yeah. Uh, Self-evident? Is, is, is that part of the thinking as well? I don't know if it's self-evident or not, right? Self-evident implies that um, everyone is aware of it. Right. Um, and I don't know that everyone is um, in the sense that um, we're not all taught that that we are worthy. Um, and when you don't feel worthy, it's really like worthy of love and acceptance. And um, if, you, if you don't understand yourself to be worthy, how could you even understand yourself hmm. to have such a spark within you. Hmm. Um, I think our world 
and and some hurtful theologies have done a lot to um, leave people feeling bereft and and that they aren't deserving of love. Um, and so one of one of our core values is holding the space for all to be included, to all know that um, wherever they have been, that that spark exists within them, that they are worthy of love and acceptance. By merit of being humans. By merit of being humans. Apart from how they were made. Yeah. And that, I think that summarizes really neatly the half-shadedness of, of the Unitarian Universalist position and the historical Christian position. And so I'm grateful for that point of common cause. Um, obviously, there are groups or, or groups are just ideologies that I disagree with on a mountain of theological things, but who say people are inherently valuable and yeah. Public morality and personal morality begins with the assumption of the value of yourself and others. Mm -hmm. And well, I'm really excited about that. that I can high five a whole yep. lot of people and be like, "Cool, yeah. hey, is, uh, we can sure yep. share we can space. Work together we can on, work together yep. on a mm -hmm. ton of stuff. Yeah. We can share a room. We can share a table. Yep. The the fringe groups throughout history who would say, uh, "No, people do not have value." Full stop. They just don't. That's terrifying to me. Yeah. No, all that has value is this grand vision for how things ought to be that I have. Well, wait a minute. Your grand vision is made of people, and people are inherently valuable. Mm -hmm. I, those people freak me out. I, I have a feeling you and I could spend weeks and weeks and weeks just having fun, kicking around all of the finer details and swapping stories about how we got to where we are because we've already done a little bit of that off camera. Yeah. And there's an amazing amount of overlap between yeah. our childhoods and what we experienced for better and for worse and all of that. And, um, and even some, right, we've kind of, right, so many, there's that, that tree of, of Christian evolution, right, yeah. um, of, of church evolution. And, um, and, and, you know, you can follow this, Unitarian branch and this Universalist branch, and it goes do do do, and then it's like off the tree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is that is literally where I would put it. I would yeah. say that um, to stretch the analogy, some kind of little like spinny seed thing went to the ground. There was a primordial ooze with some other tree that put a thing there, and a separate tree that is that bears genetic traits of this as well as other trees grew up there. And to the taxonomist, who's seen a lot of different kinds of trees and has particularly studied this one very carefully, well, this other one would be a tremendous curiosity. And that's what it's been. And um, let me tell you something I've really appreciated about the conversation. No, two things. One, your wild competence. Like you just, you know your stuff, you think it for a reason. And thank you for, for just being able to answer the heap of questions that I've thrown sure. at you. Uh, the second thing is thanks for giving me the benefit of the doubt. Like, thanks for assuming that I meant what I said when I came in, which is, I think a thing. I'm not looking for a new religion. I think this is absolutely the truth and I am for it and, and persuaded of it. Also, I'm infinitely curious and always thinking about my own faith mm -hmm. and infinitely curious to hear how someone arrived somewhere that's quite a bit different. And just the way you treated me shows me that you trusted me on that. So uh, thank you. I mean, I feel like that's part of my job as a Unitarian Universalist also, right? Like we're, we're <laughs> the irony of being a Unitarian Universalist is that um, 
our folks are are so opposed to proselytizing hmm. that they sometimes forget to evangelize and um and you know i it, it's not my job nor do i want to convert someone right um and so to meet people where they're at is you know what we're trying to do as a congregation too. That's appreciated. I have one more question I'd like to try to thread back in mm -hmm. to, um, to earlier, but I, I can feel the clock. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I want to chase it down quickly. Uh, I think you're going to have, I think you're going to have insight on this. So we talk about the, the two flags up front. Mm -hmm. And thank you for bearing with me on just butchering the language. And I know I'm a bull in a china shop. I'm saying it all wrong, but but I'm appreciative of the places where, again, we have value overlap even on those things. Mm -hmm. um, justice is a key word that keeps coming up in that yeah. context. Mm -hmm. how, how does justice happen in this world um, and the next? It, it's, it feels like there are loose ends, is my point. And there's some stuff that we can go and tackle and be like, that's an injustice that's occurring right now. Mm -hmm. And we should do something about mm -hmm. it. But then there are other injustices. Like, let's go right back to the Hitler thing. He killed six million Jews. Yeah. Like, and that doesn't even start to do get into what he did with his government and what he did to other countries. And he sowed chaos and pure evil. I think evil is a thing. I think that's what it looks like. And... I like that in Christianity there is some kind of mechanism by which that's not cool. Like That will be dealt with one way or another. Now it is possible that Christ will take that penalty upon himself in Christian theology if by some weird turn of events Hitler had some repentance thing that we didn't know about and they got covered up. Mm -hmm. I don't see any evidence for that. But there is a theological mechanism within Christianity to even have the penalty for that evil right. dealt with by, by God, that price paid by Christ. What's really difficult for me is the idea that there just is no justice, that that, that, that just goes, that there's no judgment for it, that there's no correction for it, that it, it never gets spoken to. What does the Unitarian Universalist do with the, the truly evil stuff of humanity and human history and that sense that at times it looks like there is no justice. So we talk about accountability. Okay. Um, it is impossible to have reconciliation without accountability. You mean putting people back together who are at odds? Yeah. Okay. And you may not ever achieve reconciliation but that does not mean you should not try for accountability. Um, and so, you know, you're, you're, you're asking about, you know, is there accountability for World War II, for the genocide of the Jews and the persecution of LGBTQ people and disabled people that happened during the Holocaust. And um, Unitarian Universalists uh, would say that there should be accountability, right? Like the Nuremberg trials are part of accountability. Um, and our work is to remember and to be responsible for preventing such a thing in the future. Um, and we do that by creating a more just world now. Um, for, for
for each person, they also come to that answer from their own individual perspective, right? Um, for my members who are theists, they're going to have an understanding of their own of what happens when we die. That that addresses that question. Um, and I and I think that that again comes to this question of. Um, are we more focused on living or are we more focused on dying? Hmm. And our Unitarian Universalist faith is focused on living. And what we do now to bring about a world of community and justice and equity. Um, you know, from my, I've, I've used the word beloved community, and that obviously um, comes from the Christian tradition, specifically from Martin Luther King Jr. Um, but that is an idea that holds a lot of resonance for Unitarian Universalists. Um, that we're building this promised world now, um, that we're not waiting for it. Okay, two questions coming mm -hmm. out of that. One, um, there was an air of prophecy to what you just said. Oh, I mean, the way you framed it is that it's promised. I mean, it's mm -hmm. almost kingdom language. Right. That there is this. I was trying to use language that would hold coming. meaning for you, right? Okay. So, oh, so you were unitarying me just now. Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. I'm, I'm getting a little bit of a, a sense of what it looks like. So, to you, would you view these outcomes as predicted, as prophesied, as promised? Would I think of them as prophesied or promised? Hmm. That's an interesting question. No. Okay. And the reason I, I say that is that um, I think it, I also think it's possible to mess up. And so uh I think, so as Unitarian Universalists, one of our, our big things is this idea of putting faith into action. And that may be familiar if you're familiar with the social gospel. Sure. Um, and... Or the Book of James. So... We, Unitarian Universalism as it exists today is not just a thought exercise. Okay. Um, when we do the process with our teenagers that I'm not sure we caught on camera earlier about oh, yeah. having our teenagers write their personal belief statements, as opposed to going through a catechism and Correct. affirming a creed. Correct. Okay. Um, what we always want them to answer is this question, or to craft a statement that is, I believe, therefore I do this. Which is not out of alignment with any other faith tradition, right? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I believe in God the Father and right on down the list, therefore, I'll treat people this way, uh -huh. I'll, I'll try to honor God in this right. way, I'll do this with my life. Yeah, sure. But there aren't, I feel like there is a, a distinction that we don't get to a lot um, of orthodoxy versus orthopraxy. 
So you mean right thought and right action? Mm -hmm. Okay. I do. Um, and so um, church, I think for a really, really long time has been focused on right thought. And our faith is, um, as I said earlier, focused on right character, which also translates into action. Um, and Does right character fall under right thought or right action? Both. Okay. Right? It's kind of the melding of the two. So um, right thought informs right action. what you go and do. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, so would you say Unitarianism then is in part responding to what you would perceive as an imbalance the other way in the past by putting tremendous emphasis on the right practice now as a way to serve as a corrective against imbalances previously? I don't know about that. I mean, one of the things that... that um, was really central in early Unitarianism was they still identified as Christians because um, Jesus was the model for how you achieved um, proximity with God or salvation. Um, and so you, you were to follow the example of Jesus. Uh, and to behave in ways that would have been in alignment with the teachings of Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was this combination of both the use of reason and thought in um, dealing with the Bible, and then behavior in your actions in the world. Um, and that um, way of, of being, I think, still really informs Unitarian Universalism today. Is Jesus a unique character in Unitarian Universalism? Yes. Divine? No. Remember, Unitarian. You understand why I'd ask, though? Yeah. I mean, of all the characters in all of history who it, everybody would want to know, like, oh, that guy's kind of a dividing line. Is yeah. he a guy who really caught on, or is he God in the flesh? And the Bible holds him out as decisively God in the flesh. Right. But you see a prophet, mm -hmm. a philosopher. A teacher. A teacher. Mm -hmm. And divine in the same way. I'm trying to listen mm -hmm. and repeat back to make sure I get it. Mm -hmm. Divine in the same way that each individual has a spark of divinity, mm -hmm. but not in a unique way. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, that spark of divinity, right, that's my personal theological understanding. And, and that's new for me, that there's yeah. enough wiggle room mm -hmm. that, that you could think and articulate things with passion and clarity that a member of your congregation who's in full membership yeah. might say completely differently. Yes. Uh -huh. So thank you for your patience with me on that. That's that's a new category. And you could talk to another minister who would have a different understanding. Is there evil in Unitarianism? I could give you an articulation of evil. Uh, that, from from my perspective. Um, but it's really not any different from my understanding of sin. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, I, I just savagely killing somebody, that would be sin and evil. Mm -hmm. Like, pick a term. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree with you on that. Yeah. What do you hope happens? What do you hope happens in the life of somebody who attends and in the life of your church in general? I want our congregation to be a place where you can develop your 
understanding of meaning and truth. I want our congregation to be a place where people feel connected and which fosters broader connections in the larger St. Louis community. And I want our congregation to be a place where those connections lead to partnerships where we make St. Louis a place of mutual thriving for all people. Thank you for taking time with me, answering a ton of questions. Thank you. Thanks for coming to St. Louis. Right on. Well, this whole thing started with me wanting to learn more about Unitarian Universalism from somebody who knows what they're talking about and actually practices it. And well, now I know more about Unitarian Universalism, and I feel like I got a really good, honest look at it from somebody who's of goodwill. I'm super grateful for that. So even though I just got done like 15 seconds ago saying thanks to Reverend Kim, to Reverend Kim, now I'm at this desk and I'm going to say it again. I'm really thankful to her. She's an important person who runs a whole institution. There are grounds to maintain and just tangible administrative detail stuff and people's lives. She's got a lot going on and she blew all of that off for the better part of a day to hang out with me and my friends who she'd never met and has no history with, knowing full well that we were not going there because we were looking to maybe try a new religion out or convert. No, she knew that I was coming in because I simply wanted to understand and be challenged a little bit and learn. I wanted to hear a steel manning of, of someone else's understanding of their own religion. And I got that. And I'm really grateful to her for being willing to take that risk. I'm grateful to her for her competence and her ability to handle some hard questions. Some of those maybe I meant to be hard. Some of those I maybe didn't mean to be hard. But I don't know, every set of ideas has their vulnerabilities. And I appreciated that she was willing to take the time and think and reflect as she gathered her answers on maybe some of the more challenging points. Uh, I just felt like it was a very natural, honest conversation, and I appreciate that. But what I was getting to is that I also appreciate just the gesture in general of, uh, of somebody looking at a situation or an opportunity and saying, I don't know that I really have a ton to gain here. I don't know if this advances this thing or that thing, but I know it's good to talk with people who aren't just like me. I know it is good for us to get outside of our bubbles and to meet people with whom we don't share the exact same set of, con of convictions, to find common ground, to challenge each other, to learn and to grow. I think this is really good for society and the world. And this step outside of our bubble conversation only happened because of the courage and willingness of Reverend Kim. I super respect her for it, and I'm super grateful for it. And I'd be grateful if you'd let her know if you appreciated that as well down in the comment section. I'm going to think about this some more. I want to do a follow-up video where I sit and share some of my reflections on all of this, the ways that it challenged me, some of the questions I might still have. But <laughs> look at the timestamp. This is forever. It's like the longest video I've ever published. So I'm going to call it good there, and we'll do a follow-up down the road. Thanks again to Reverend Kim, to First Unitarian Church of St. Louis, Missouri, and thanks to all of you for being willing to do a conversation that is very different for us as well. All right, Matt, thanks for hanging out with me on my YouTube channel. Let's do this again soon.